Welcome to the Honky Tonk Cabin on Vague Radio UK. We are the only program that plays country music exclusively by UK country artists. And talking of UK country artists, over the last few weeks, we played you music by artists appearing at the Buckland Boots Festival. Well, me and the Honky Tonk crew were actually there last weekend, and we met up with a number of the people there, like Kezia Gill and Jess Kemp. But in today's program, we're also playing some music from Lucy Blue and Between the Vines, who were late replacements for some of the overseas artists who couldn't make it. But first up, let's hear from Gasoline and Matches, and then we'll have a chat with them. I am a traveller I'm not the staying kind I leave my souls where they find me And my feet go where they find The side of gold And fools go blind Delighted to welcome to the Honky Tonk Cabin, BCMA award-winning duo, Sally Ray and Steve, Gasoline and Matches. Now you guys have done something that's quite unusual in that you've just released two uh, songs just a few weeks apart, Never Have I Ever and Smiling Viper. Why release two songs so close together? Honestly, um, we were due to release Never Have I Ever pre-Covid. 
Um, the song was lined up for release way before, and it just didn't quite happen at the right time for us that we felt. Um, we, we've been sitting on a lot of recorded music for a long time. We've actually got an album's worth of music. Um, but these days, a lot of artists are deciding to release everything digital, uh, pre uh, sort of having a physical copy. We will have physical copies at some point, but um, we felt it was the right time. We knew that Buckingham Boots was coming, we knew it was going to be our first full band performance, and uh, why not come out with a couple of uh, banging tunes to get people uh, ready. Smiling Viper, what was the motivation behind that song? So, it's not just a music industry thing. I think in life everyone meets people that smile to their faces, lovely to their faces, and then say a lot of bad things behind your back when your back's turned. And my dad's always called these kinds of people Smiling Vipers, where it's someone that gives you a big grin and you know that they've got other intentions. So, um, that's how that one came about and we were fortunate enough we actually wrote that track a couple of years back when we went on a trip to Nashville um, with our friend Jen Bostick who's a sensational songwriter and um, she's she's like my musical therapist because every time I've sat down with her I've been in a really angry state and I just need to get the song out but she really brought that track to life. Yeah it, collectively the three of us sat in Jen's songwriting room and it came within like an hour or two uh, and it just it was instantly there. Jen was playing piano along with it. We were all singing to sound. Now, talking about songwriting, what's your process? Do you have a process? Uh, an unorthodox process, maybe. Um, we, we, we don't set aside a time to do it, it just has to come naturally for us. Sally will bring the song to me, the lyrics, and uh, some music. I will construct the music to be more interesting for me as a, as, as a guitar player and maybe add a bridge here and there. Um, I will often have a full song that's completely scripted. My lyrics um, aren't always as sharp as Sally's, so Sally's a fantastic lyricist. So we help each other in that way. So it's never a time when, oh it's Wednesday, we're going to sit down and write a song, it has to happen. Yeah, I think we're not very disciplined songwriters in that manner. That's why sometimes we're not writing maybe as much as we should. We love the live performance. So, you know, when the world was go at full pelt and we were going for it, we were sometimes playing five gigs in a week. So we were doing a lot of live performance. But I, I also feel that for me, I write a song when I have something I actually want to say, rather than just trying to churn something out just to write a song for the sake of it. That's why I think all of our songs have quite strong meanings behind them. Even if they're, you know, never have I ever, even if it's a fun song, it's that's got a purpose to the song, you know, so. And do you keep a notebook by your bed to think? Ah. I do, actually, I've had dreams where I've sometimes woke up and I've had a song idea or you know, you sat on the train or you, you it's even sometimes mid-performance because we do a lot of bar gigs as well where we're playing other people's songs. Sometimes you see something and it just gets your thoughts going and I'll make a little note down on my phone or my iPad while we're actually even doing a gig sometimes. But then that all the notes you build up and then it kind of comes together for a song. And sometimes Steve has written a nice guitar riff and I'm like, oh, do you know what? I've got some lyrics that would fit really nicely with that. So. And do you go back and revisit and polish and change? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And most of our songs, I mean, they've been a long time in, um, you know, in process really, because even with our first EP that we put out, a lot of those songs, Tequila's a Healer, um, If You Want to Stay, I wrote those songs when I was actually living in South Carolina and I was over there on my own and this was before Steve and I had really started making music together so those songs were written back in like 2014, 2015 but they didn't really find their life until we sat down at a later date and reworked them a little bit. And you've got a new project on the go, um, talk to us a bit about that years. It started in 2017. We decided we needed something in Birmingham because there wasn't a whole lot of country nights going on and we just wanted to create a nice intimate environment not dissimilar to Bluebird Cafe, Nashville style. It, it actually has the same capacity. You can fit 80 people in that room and we wanted to create something that so when artists were actually playing around the UK that they had a reason to come to Birmingham because there's a lot of artists that miss Birmingham out. It's almost like they think there's not a crowd there but we sell this night out yeah. every time we run it and we've had some amazing UK acts. We've also had a few Nashville artists, Kenny Foster. Um, the next one we've we've actually got booked, uh, Alyssa Bonagura is coming to play with us later in August. 
Um, so, you know, word is getting around and pe people that we didn't think would play our little song right now are coming and playing it and it's been quite a wonderful thing, really. Yeah, great. So what else have you got going on? Have you got an album coming out this year or are you going to release more singles? Yeah. I think the plan is for me, I, I mean, we haven't really discussed this in too much depth, have we? But I think for me, releasing music digitally is so much um, easier these days. A lot of our peers and friends are doing the same thing. Um, it's, you know, when we do festivals, it is, there are a lot of people that want to buy CDs, so um, we will have physical copies, but I think for me it'd be great to release a number of songs yeah. throughout the year, to just keep the excitement. I think it is, we're trying, that's, that was one of the reasons we did drop another song so fast, it's just trying to create a bit of momentum, and I think that we've been talking for so long before the world stopped saying you know we're going to bring an album out this is going to be on the album and we've got that album's worth of songs and they do feel quite you know the same time frame that we've put these songs together so they do feel like they're, they're a family of songs but I think the way that we're probably going to be releasing them is digitally and then maybe we'll sneak a bonus track onto the CD so we give people a reason to buy the CD because they will all eventually go on the same album as a physical release so yeah. Right, great. Now I think it's time we should listen to Smiling Viper. So Steve, Sally Ray, thank you. Your words are like poison Infecting my soul I can't ignore them They swallowed me whole I'm the addiction You can't put down You play
Okay, delighted to have with me in the Honky Tonk cabin, Jess Kemp from Manchester. Jess, congratulations on getting to uh, Buckle and Boots. Now, we're recording this before the event took place. So what are you looking forward to about Buckle and Boots? Um, well, I I know the, the Hancock family that run Buckle and Boots quite well. I've played a few gigs at their farm over the years. Um, and I just know what amazing vibe it's going to be there. Country music for me is a huge kind of passion. I've grown up listening to it. There's definitely a large influence of country music on my own music. Um, so it's going to be amazing, I think, to just watch the wide spectrum of lineup that they've got and just get out there and have a look what else is going on. And again, like I said, it's just good vibes. Everyone's there to have a good time. And the country music scene is so chilled and so friendly. So, yeah. Good. Now, you are actually opening up on the main stage on the Saturday. Are you playing totally solo or have you got a band with you? I'm playing a duo slot. So it's myself and my, in a full band, he would be my guitarist, but we're doing a little something a little bit different for Buckle and Boots. Um, we're actually going to do a song with a mandolin as well. So there's going to be quite a little bit of experimentation in there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's duo, but it's still upbeat. So if you're down there, make sure you're up and at the, at the main stage and we'll, we'll get the party started really. <laughs> now, one of your influences is Taylor Swift. Is that yeah. where the country influence comes from? It is. Um, so I'm a massive Taylor Swift fan. I think that's so stereotypical of someone of my age to say as well, a female singer-songwriter at 26. I think I've grown up listening to Taylor Swift. Um, I idolised her when I was in high school, but I also am a big fan of Dolly Parton and Loretta Lynn. Um, I listen to quite a lot of current country pop, so bands like Brothers Osborne, um, Little Big Town, um, Sugarland. There's quite a lot of bands that I've just like. They're always my go-to bands. I have a I have a playlist on Spotify called Friday Night Country, and it's literally like all those Zac Brown band that kind of thing. And it's just it's my go-to. Ward Thomas as well, another British act. So yeah, I'm a big fan of the kind of current country pop but over the years I've my granddad's a huge kind of country and western fan so I've grown up listening to a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff yeah. now one of the things I always like to find out is because I think every musician has good gigs and bad gigs but when musicians get together they always say what's the really poor or bad gigs that you've played or the funny memories you've got what are yours Oh, this is what I always go back to. So I have a single called Bondo Park, which is about a time when myself and my band went over to Amsterdam. I just had this urge after, I was kind of in the middle of university myself and I had this urge to go and play a string of gigs in Europe. And it kind of didn't come to fruition as a bit of a European tour like we'd liked it to. But we ended up getting a string of gigs in Amsterdam over the space of a week, which was amazing. Um, so a load of us went over there, the band, quite a lot of people followed in tow, it was about 40 of us in total. And there was this one bar, and it doesn't exist anymore, um, but there was this one bar that we turned up and it was a, it was kind of a reputable music venue, a lot of bands were playing there if they were touring. Um, and the guy that ran it, he was so passionate about music, but he was so very dead set in his rules. And when we got there, he said, right, you need to sit down because I've got my rule book. And, you know, we just laughed and thought, oh, <laughs> he's being sarcastic. No, he got this big, like, file out and was like, okay, page one. <laughs> like, um, in Amsterdam, there's a rule about how loud music can be. And if you're a band on stage, you have to look at the decibelometer up in the top corner of the room and check that you've not got it kind of going over the um, threshold. But that was like, that was easy. That was the easy bit. Um, the biggest kind of issue was because this bar had been set up in a residential area that it probably shouldn't have been set up in, they had like a vacuum system on the door. So they had one door where you come in off the street and then a corridor type thing, not very long, and then another door. But the gap between the doors wasn't long enough really to go in, shut the door and then open the other door. It was kind of a, you had to open them both at the same time. And when that happened, the owner, 
who was working behind the bar, would literally unplug the PA and shout down his own microphone, shut the door, with a load of kind of effing and jeffing in between it. So you'd be like mid-song, and I remember we were kind of in the middle of our opening track, really going for it, really hyped up, and he just cut the sound completely, which is really awkward as a musician if you're kind of going for it and then everything is just not up. So, yeah, that was probably the worst gig, but it was bad because it was so strange. And you were doing a lot online to get things, keep things going. But now we're out of lockdown. I was looking at your bookings list and you seem quite busy at weekends for the next several months. Are you pleased <laughs> with how it's going? Yeah, so pleased. I mean, just before we came on to this recording, we were chatting and I was explaining that through lockdown, I've picked up um, some freelance work teaching music business to university students uh, which is amazing um but partnering that with getting back out there in the live scene is absolutely fantastic and being able to look at the calendar and actually see gig bookings coming in and it's, it's just amazing and getting out there and starting it off again with festival season i mean buckle and boots will be the first festival i've played since the summer of 2019 so it's a long time um and what what better way to kick it back off yeah, have you had to do lots of rehearsal to get ready to do live gigs again? 
Um, I mean, as a soloist, I've been doing bits. I've been out gigging myself since sort of since April, really, since the pubs reopened. And um, been doing it kind of with COVID safe um, things in place. But yeah, it's. I was speaking to Sam, um, who I'm playing with at Buffalo Boots the other day, and we've got a rehearsal booked in next week. We've had a couple of things in the lead up, and we've been chatting through the set, and it's just those kind of um, butterflies in the stomach when you're coming up to a big show they're what sort of I live for with gigging um, and I, I just love stuff like that and festival season always brings it back so uh, yeah I think it was strange being back on the stage but I think the excitement will be more than anything else. Question I wanted to ask you your previous single We Were Falling the video for that where you get splattered in paint <laughs> how difficult was that to make and how much paint did you end up swallowing? Oh, loads! Honestly, we recorded that music video in Hull, and um, in it was it was it's when was it February, two thousand and twenty. So it was it was freezing. We were we recorded at a place called O'Reilly's, um, which is like a big music venue. But the floor is concrete, and for the video, because I didn't want to ruin any shoes, I had bare feet, and it was freezing. Um, it was snowing in Hull that day, and yet yeah, I swallowed a lot of pain. It, a lot of it went in my eyes. A lot of it just wouldn't come out of my hair for, for days. But it was worth it. It was fun, and it became a little bit of a trademark. The whole multicolored thing um, from a single I released back in two thousand and eighteen called "No Shouting," where I did the same thing for a video, except with paint powder, and that was a big mistake because paint powder gets everywhere. Whereas actual paint, at least, it's not sort of being inhaled. Um, <laughs> But yeah, lots of fun, lots of fun. So call it what you want Singing to the place I belong High above the hills where the sun sets Watching the sky turn blue I've known it all along That you were I want to go strong You came out of a dark we were broken, but in daylight we're all brand new But I watched the face too black and me I put the pieces back and now you're
Just looking for the good advice Searching through the rubble Searching for the life Trying to figure out At what point the journey changed Why promises of sunlight Left me dancing in the rain And Maverick magazine said she is no doubt one of Britain's finest, soon to be one of the world's finest singer-songwriters. Kezia, welcome. Um, you write a lot of your own material. Over the years, your act has probably changed with more of your own material and less covers. What percentage now is your own material? Um, well, I, I, I love to be doing 100 percent but it doesn't quite work that way um i still have i only make a living through music so it's my full-time job and um, so i do an awful lot of weddings and i do theater shows and corporate events and they will always want you to do cover music so a large majority of my work is is cover music but my, my passion is what really drives me with music is my original and um, so when i do festivals like this i try to make them predominantly original and um, I, I never shy away from throwing in covers because I do believe you can put your own spin on any song um, and I've always loved to put my own twist on music so it's about making it your own but yes I'll always strive to do 100% but I'd say at the moment it's a split between the two. 
yeah, talk to Whitney Houston about covers. Yes, <laughs> exactly. She's so well known for I Will Always Love You, and people don't even it's know it's a great Dolly song. Yeah. Exactly. You, you really can make music your own. It's how you tell the story. Okay. And which is your favourite of the songs you've written? Gosh, it's like asking me to choose a child. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I think just purely for personal reasons and in terms of what means the most to me, it would be Local Man Star. Um, it was an incredibly hard song to write and it took it probably took me five or six years to put it together. I had the idea and I never really quite knew how to put it together and when I, when I had the song that we all now know as Local Man Star, I finally sat back and said that's what I want it to be. Um, and I was very fortunate that, that my dad got to hear it before he passed away because it is obviously a tribute to his life. Um, and it, and it was one of my proudest moments is that he got to hear it and he, he saw me perform it live. So that is probably the song that means the most. And yeah, you, you've got a big family connection because your brother plays your younger dad. That's right. And your mum did the poster. Yes, that's right. As she used to do All these the little day. things were so important, you know, and I wanted it to be as authentic as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, family and music are, are completely intertwined. You can't have one without the other. I'm from a large um, Irish family and music is just deep veined throughout all of us. So the bond of our family is music. So you, you don't get one without the other. So it's incredibly personal, that one. Yeah, now I've seen you on stage with your dad and with your mum. Yes. So I didn't realise she was a singer till then. <laughs> but do your brother and your sister sing? Yeah, so I've got uh, an older brother and he plays guitar and he sings. He used to do um, theatre shows and cruise ships and he's, he's got a beautiful deep voice. Uh, he, he can sing Johnny Cash just as well as Johnny Cash can, if not better. <laughs> and I've got, um, I've got two sisters as well, one older, one younger. They can both sing. Admittedly, they are sort of they do it for fun they're more sort of karaoke singers but they have beautiful voices and uh, my younger sister especially we used to sing together we sing in close two-part harmony um and i keep trying to get her to come on the road with me like we can be the next ward thomas but she's having none of it <laughs> and she's having none of it <laughs> yeah because it's always there's an old saying that family make the best harmonies uh, that sibling harmony is a, is absolutely a thing because you've got groups like wild kin that have yeah. tremendous harmonies and two sisters and cousins yeah absolutely like i just mentioned there you know Ward thomas even going right back to the jackson five that, that family connection is it's, it's just something there's an ear there's a sound and uh, my family absolutely has that yeah so in terms of you learning your stagecraft how much impact did you have um, total impact. Um, I basically wouldn't be the artist I am today, if, if an artist at all actually, if it wasn't for him. I was very fortunate enough to, to grow up being able to go to shows with him. He used to play a lot of clubs and pubs and you know, back in them days kids could go and I just grew up idolising him and he always used to say to me, I taught you nothing. I never taught you a thing, but I learned everything watching him. I just used to sit and watch. Um, and I feel like that's where I really learned my craft. I learned not only how to be on stage, but even more importantly, how to be off stage, how to talk to people, the importance of learning people's names, the importance of if someone would come in one evening and ask for a request, which you don't know, if you know they're going to come back next week, take the time to learn that song for them and then they'll be friends and fans for life and all the years I worked in Spain people had come back on holiday two or three times a year if I didn't know the song the night they asked for it I'd know it next time I saw them and these were all little skills that I learned from my dad and, and yeah it's the best teacher I could have asked for his hair was black the darkest black and his voice was velvet smooth Ran away from home, did it all on his own. Just a young man with nothing to lose. He came from afar to hear his 12 string guitar and to hear that angel sing.
speak his name. They remember, they remember him. Johnny was selling records, and Willie was riding hips, and Elvis was breaking hearts. We want to shake out his hips. My daddy was singing for a living in the back street bar. Is a working class hero, a local man star. with your Friday night crew and uh, how did that happen? It was just a complete coincidence. I was due to play in Saltburn um, out in the northeast, due to have a gig on the Friday, uh, we'd sold tickets and as we all remember we were told by the, the Prime Minister that we had to stay at home on the Monday. Um, <clears throat> we were all told we had to sort of lock down and it was, it was actually the, the 23rd of March that we were told to stay at home. And the day after on the Tuesday was my dad's funeral. Um, and we were only allowed 18 people, so all we were allowed. It was a very small service and it was a real strange week because everyone was told to stay at home, yet there was this huge thing happening personally for me when I really needed my family around me. So when the Friday was, was coming and I was due to have this gig, I said to my husband, I said, do you know what? I said, I've seen a few people doing these Facebook Lives. I, I might just do something just for the people that had bought tickets that can't make the show and 380 people tuned into that gig we'd only sold 40 tickets <laughs> and 380 people tuned in for that show and the overwhelming response was are you going to do another one are you going to do another one and with it being a Friday I just sort of said oh same time next week and in the end we did 60 shows and have you stopped them now? I have stopped them now only because live music has resumed we're all sort of allowed out to play again um, for how long I don't know but that little period of time that sort of 15 16 months was just it was something I never thought would happen but actually it turned out to be an incredible time and the, the Friday night crew as we affectionately named them they helped me grieve they helped me heal and um, they allowed me to be an artist when there was no music so I've, I am eternally grateful to them I think that's why we have such a nice bond, I think. We, we, we helped each other. Mm -hmm. um, now, as a songwriter, one of the things that always interests me is your songwriting process. Do you have a particular way you write songs? I don't think I do, and I get asked this question a lot. Um, people always ask me what comes first, the music or the lyrics, whether I schedule time to write, and, and the, the answer is no. I never schedule time to write and the times I have it just ends in me staring at a blank piece of paper um, I'm not I can't turn on the creativity I don't I don't really work like that for me it's more I'll have a thought in the middle of the night and think right quickly put a note in my phone and then the next morning I have to write that song it's like an idea will come out of nowhere or somebody will say something or I'll see something and I have notes in my phone and then I can't think about anything until that is out of my head. Um, but I never know when it's going to come. Um, I have experienced writer's block. I've not written a song for over a year. And then suddenly I'll write 10 in two weeks. So I never know when they're going to come, but I'm always pleased when they do. 
<laughs> but is that is that what happened with I'm here? Because you did that to so I, boots in well, I'm here again. Was um, I've been asked by the lovely uh, Reverend Lynn to um, be part of the Sunday service. She'd sent me uh, the script for the day and what she would be talking about, um, having people around, forgiveness. Um, having people to lean on, not being afraid to say you need help. She, and she said, if you can just sing something that roughly fits. And I was, I was racking my brain, I couldn't think of anything. And I was just, I thought, oh, something will come to me, something will come to me. And it got to the day before, and I was like, wow, no, nothing has come to me. I'm, I better write something, I better write something. So I sat in the tent, and it was um, literally, I had a brief, I needed to write something. I just wrote, and I thought about a personal situation where somebody's come to me for help. And I thought the best thing you can say to somebody in their most vulnerable time is, I'm here if you need me. If you don't, if you do, I'm here. And that's what I started with. And I'm happy to say it, it just came out. But I would have never, ever have written that song had I not been in that situation. And it actually turned out to be my most streamed song on Spotify. I think it really touched a nerve with people. And we, we ran a whole mental health campaign for, for the whole month of July. Um, and I'm so grateful for that song, but yeah, written completely by accident. <laughs> Best things sometimes happen. Absolutely, like absolutely. Um, what are your plans for the future? You've got a busy year looking at your, your gig guy. Yeah, very busy, uh, partly because an awful lot has rolled over from last year. Um, but um, festival season is just really starting to get swinging now. I did Tennessee Fields a few weeks ago, um, obviously Crack by the Creek. I'm headlining Buffalo of Boots next week. And then I've got um, a theatre show, which is celebrating the Friday night streams. It's called the Pour Me A Strong One live show. And it's basically just me on the sofa, but in a theatre with all of the crew. There are still a few tickets left. I'd really like to get that one sold out. So if you want to come along. Um, and yeah, just it, it's just so good to be out singing again and you know getting to sing my new music as well because I've produced an EP throughout lockdown so getting to play my new songs for the first time it's just, just so exciting. There's so much we can talk about <laughs> but thank you Kezia for your time. Thank you so Brilliant. much for chatting to me. Oh, thank you.
Well, hope you've enjoyed today's show, and particularly the chats from Kezia, Gasoline and Matches and Jess Kemp. Now, next week's programme, we're having a chat with Gary Quinn, one of the organisers of Buffalo and Boots, and also a six-time award-winning member of the British Country Music Association. But to play us out, this is Between the Vines with their single, All In. Shoot!